said, hey, he's great at what he does. Rocco Miller joins us on 365 Sports. Rocco, thanks for your time. I know you just got finished doing an hour plus with the field of 68.com. So I, I would like to go over the Big 12 teams initially. Uh, Craig and Paul with me as well. Can Baylor stay on the number two line? And if if yes, what do they need to happen tonight? Yeah, I appreciate that. And thanks for having me on, gentlemen. Um, yeah, Baylor uh, right now, I, you know, they're, they're in an interesting spot, obviously finishing with those two losses to Iowa State. Um, you know, it really comes down to a couple of factors um, that maybe most fans are not thinking about, which are, uh, A, how far along is the committee in their process right now? Um, if this would have been a year ago, um, it might be a situation where Baylor just stays on the two, might not be enough reason to move them. Um, you know, obviously the, the late losses should be factored in, and I, I would agree with that too. But um, in some of these cases, if there's not enough overwhelming evidence to move them down to a three, um, they probably will just stay there. Um, I would agree that Baylor is probably the, the lowest of the two seeds between them, UCLA, Texas, and Arizona today. Um, but but there's a team in the, in the three seed area, uh, actually two teams that are pretty hot, both Gonzaga and Marquette, uh, that would love to move up if they can. And um, you know it really just depends on where they're at with their process. You know last last year we had several examples of teams during championship week that should have either moved down or up. Um, I think pretty pretty unanimously, um, and the committee just kind of left them where they were. So um, if you're a Baylor fan, which I know you guys are, um, that's what I'd be hoping for. Uh, Rocco, how much, and I'm, this is just me kind of randomly saying this, if you look at, I mean, look, they lost to Marquette, they beat Gonzaga. So, like, that, right. you know, is it, kind of strange for them when you mention those two teams. But Baylor has ten losses. Five of them are to two teams, Kansas State and Iowa State. So how much does that factor into the co committee's decision? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. That all of that information, every game on their schedule, all the scores of their games this year, are right there in front of us. Um, you know, I'm looking at the same team sheet that the committee can see and all the different rankings that are associated with that. You know, I think I think maybe with Gonzaga trying to pass them right now, that win over them could be something that is somewhat of a tiebreaker. Um, it just really depends on, you know, how close they think that comparison is. Um, I think those losses that you mentioned with both Kansas State and Iowa State don't really help Baylor's case because both those teams are, are – right now um, below the Bears. So I, I think, you know, from that standpoint, um, you, you would hope that they're kind of just looking at the, the whole body of work. Um, you know, the road win at TCU is very strong. I think, obviously, some really great home wins with Kansas and Texas. And then beating UCLA out in Vegas uh, has obviously aged very well with UCLA being probably the fifth best team right now. So, um, you know, some of those reasons and the fact that Baylor was already up here at, on February 18th, we all know that from the – bracket preview show that they had um and they started at at the number seven overall position um it's just gonna be really hard to move baylor down that far um but yeah it's it's possible they can move down to like the top of the three seed line but but i think that's really all it comes down to rocco uh, what are you eyeing as far as uh, the texas longhorns and rodney terry go yeah i mean they're right there they're playing great ball and and i think they're they're probably sixth overall uh that's where i have them just below ucla um, they have very different resumes. Anybody in the Big 12 has just a crazy amount of data because um, <laughs> every single game is, is almost a quad one or it is a quad one. Um, but Texas obviously has gotten 12 and 8 in those games. Um, you know, I, I start and stop with, with road games. So they got road wins at Kansas State and at West Virginia. Um, they also won at Oklahoma State, a team that's right on the cut line today. Um, but all of those are very difficult buildings to win in, and, and they got those. Um, and that goes along with a great home resume where they beat Gonzaga, they beat Creighton, they beat Kansas, and they beat Baylor. So um, on top of Iowa State and TCU, they have an amazing home record in that new, in that new arena. So um, Texas is right there. I mean, you would think if Purdue lost, they might be able to pass them. Uh, but again, the committee process is – is well underway. It started Wednesday morning. Uh, we're talking here on a Friday. Um, I just think Texas is probably set on a two seed no matter what they play for this weekend. I know uh, that's a little frustrating, but I think that's just the reality. Uh, yeah, and, and right now, would you say that Kansas, UCLA, you mentioned them, Baylor had beaten them earlier this year, uh, it, Houston and is it Alabama or is it Purdue? How, who, who are the number one seeds in your opinion? 
Yeah, so um, just to bring everybody back to the, a few weeks ago when the committee came on CBS and they announced Al- it was in that order uh, on that day, it was Alabama 1, it was Houston 2, which was a kind of a surprise for a lot of people, um, and then Kansas was um, actually fourth with Purdue 3. Um, we found out a little bit later after that show that they finished up uh, doing their work earlier in the week, which uh, at the time Purdue had lost um on that thursday um so i think i think everybody feels good putting kansas at least third in the order now and purdue fourth um and then all alabama has has lost since since that day as the number one overall team was the final game of the year at texas a&m uh alabama just won today pretty convincingly against mississippi state um so i'm personally leaving alabama as the top overall team i just don't think there's enough evidence to remove them um, but Houston's very interesting because they have not lost. They, of course, play in a, in a league where they don't get many opportunities. Um, but if, if the reason they had Houston higher than Kansas in the beginning was because of the strength of all their power numbers and their perfect record away from home, Houston has not lost uh, at, uh, away from home at all this year, um, you know, then maybe it's enough to put Houston as number one overall. Um, but I think that leaves Kansas uh, stuck in the third position which I know could be very frustrating if you look at just the quantity of all their quad one wins. Um, it's just where I think this committee and my, my job is to really guess what they're going to do and be as close to the pin as I can get. Um, I, I think the committee is going to leave Kansas in that third position on the number one line. So that means that they probably don't wind up in Kansas city, right? Well, that's fascinating because um, the way it stands today, if, if, if my order is correct, Alabama would get Louisville. Houston would get Kansas City, so you would be correct. Um, however, if Houston ends up number one, uh, it's an interesting uh, part of the process. The number one overall team gets to choose where they go. Um, and I have texted with a few people over there at Houston, and um, it sounds like they're leaning towards going to Vegas um, if they get that choice, um, which would be perfect for everybody because then Kansas could get Kansas City, Alabama could get Louisville, and then you just send Purdue to the east. But um, it, the only way that really will happen is if Houston is the number one overall team. So um, that's the only way I can see uh, Kansas getting Kansas City unless there's some late upsets today and um, the, the committee actually takes those upsets into account. Texas, Kansas, Iowa State, Kansas State, Baylor, TCU are six that we know are in from the Big 12. Is West Virginia in? Yes. Yeah, West Virginia's done enough. Um, uh, you know, they, they did have a lot of losses. We know that. But I think I think West Virginia, you know, down the stretch, they got the wins they needed, and, and they're going to get in. And, and not only are they going to get in, um, they're actually going to be seated much higher than the, than the bubble teams just because when you look at all their performance metrics, which are, um, you know, the, the three that are on the team sheet, just so the fans are aware, uh, the Sagarin rating, the Ken Palm rating, and the BPI by ESPN are all listed. They tend to uh, really look at that for seeding purposes, and that, that's going to help West Virginia, I think, get all the way up into an 8-9 game, um, not like a 10 or an 11 seed. Um, and most of us on Field of 68, we agree uh, that, that West Virginia should be a 9 seed today. Uh, so I think they're in good shape. Who do you think uh, is the scariest, maybe like below four seed team? The scariest. I like that question. Um, you know, I, I think the way Texas A&M has played, I, I know they're, they're pro- probably a rival of yours from the old days, <laughs> but the, the way they steamrolled the SEC for since January, you know, part of the reason Texas A&M is only showing up as a seven seed today is because they had some bad losses around uh, the holidays and, and in the early part of the year when they lost to Wofford. Um, and they had a couple other uh, rough losses there, but they were, they've been a different team in league play. They went uh, 15 and three in the SEC um, you know, if not for a late loss, they had a chance to win the SEC championship. Um, and they're just, they're just a really tough physical team. Uh, and they're very confident right now. Uh, a team that I got to see live when they played at Florida. I, I was down there that week. So um, just really impressed by them. That's, that's one I'll throw out there, especially since they're local. Um, another team I think that's just tough in general, uh, that might be an eight or nine seed is, is Memphis. Uh, Memphis has players that are 20 you know a lot of their players are 23 24 or even d'angelo williams is 26 years old (laughs) it's just an old team that is very physical a lot of teams are gonna have a hard time matching up i think with memphis all right so rocco you uh, paul mentioned a team a&m's obviously hot beat alabama saturday they're playing tonight is there somebody that's good 
Tennessee had that great run, and then they had injuries. They were beaten today by Missouri. Are they? Do they go about the seeding with how healthy a roster might be? Is that a discussion inside that room? It most certainly is. Yes. So uh, even, even uh, you know, and I try to I try to pay attention really closely to what each committee cares about because each year we'll lose three or four people off of a committee, and three or four new people will join. So it's not the same every year. Um, and certain committees have certainly uh, looked at injuries in a, in a big way. I think the, the most significant one was years back when Notre Dame was pretty clearly not a tournament team, and they almost put them in the field. They were the first team out just because Fonzie Colson missed a month. Um, so they were evaluating Notre Dame that year uh, as if as if they were going to have him available, which they would have. Um, so they start to look at teams like that where – uh, what's the team that you're bringing to the dance versus what's, what's the team that you had before and, and all the reasons behind it. Um, and they even talked about it this year. So on that preview show, two of the teams that just missed the top 16 were TCU and uh, Creighton. And of course, TCU had some, uh, had a bad loss to Northwestern state without Mike miles. They also had another loss or two without Mike miles. And, and I think they're higher on TCU than maybe their, their resume suggests. Same thing with Creighton with, Hulk Brenner, the big man, uh, missing six games or, or up close to six games with Mono. They had a six-game losing streak. And some of those games when he even showed up in the game, he didn't look like himself. They've clearly played much better since. So so I think, you know, as it goes to, to the Tennessee discussion now, um, them losing to Missouri today, as long as that's factored in, um, I you know, I think they're looking at Tennessee a little bit differently. They're looking at a team that isn't as strong as maybe they were the, re- the rest of the year not something that's going to dramatically change Tennessee's destiny, but it could certainly be enough to drop them from a three seed to a four seed. And that's actually something we just talked a lot about on the show today. Rocco, do you think that um, there's a team that nobody's thinking about, like you mentioned A&M, but a team that nobody's thinking about that could really make a a run uh, that people are maybe counting out because of one weakness or something? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think the one that I usually lean on is Florida Atlantic. I, I think it's not because anybody might think they have a weakness, uh, but they, they come from conference USA. So maybe a lot of fans and, and the college basketball community haven't seen them play a lot. Um, but they are an incredibly cohesive team uh, that have stayed. Most of the kids, except for they have one transfer from UConn Gaffney, who I think, you know, a lot of people might remember when he was on UConn, but um, besides that, the rest of the guys been on the team, at least three seasons, and a lot of them, it's their fourth season. Um, and they were middle of the pack Conference USA team uh, last year and the year before with some upside, but just couldn't get over the hump. And now these guys are very, very strong. Um, I, I, I think it's just the fact that they don't have um, an NBA, per se, player. They have a few guys that will play overseas professionally, and they just have such a cohesive unit. Their attitudes are uh, really refreshing because they're, they're just such a team-first uh, team, which is why they just won their 30th game today. They're now 30 and three, going to the championship game against uh, UAB tomorrow. Um, but I think it's just a team also that matches up with really kind of any kind of team, uh, based on the fact that they have two great big men that they can rotate, and they have an, a, a cluster like five or six guys that can all play the one, two, or three position, and they, they can and, and they'll throw a lot of different junk defenses at teams as well. And I think that's why they've won so many games this year because. Even in their own league, Conference USA, they see a lot of different styles, physical play, zone defenses, et cetera, and they've passed the test almost every single night. Um, and I'm really anxious to see them in the tournament format because I think they're going to be a very difficult team uh, to, to eliminate. Just a couple of years ago, you know that not only Baylor won the national title, but we saw uh, McCaslin at North Texas. They ran, made a run. Obviously, Paul Mills at Oral Roberts, and here they are. Ran the table unbeaten, won the tournament. We had him on earlier this week. How dangerous can Oral Roberts be? Uh, Oral Roberts is a fantastic team. Um, you know, they, they had four cracks against Q1 teams this year, and unfortunately they fell short uh, all four times. But, of course, what they accomplished in Summit League was uh, almost unprecedented, running straight through the league, perfect, 18-0, and and then, of course, winning the tournament. Um, they were here. Uh, I, I live in the Bay Area, California, where they played St. Mary's in the opener, so I got to see them up close. Um, that ended up being a pretty good game down the stretch. They lost by eight. I, you know, I think this, that for them it's going to be a matchup thing because Oral Roberts loves to run. Mm-hmm. They, they go fast. They go up and down. Very, very fun team to watch. But if they play a team 
you know, that's, that's bigger in size or, and, and just slows the tempo down and really frustrates them. That'd be interesting to see how they counter that. Um, they were fortunate the year, uh, two years ago, uh, to, to match up with Ohio State uh, in that first round because I thought that was a team that also liked to run and, and Oral Roberts could beat them at that game. They'll need a matchup kind of like that. They, they might play Miami. A lot of people have Miami as a five, including myself. Miami loves to run. That that game, if it happens, could have 200 points without even <laughs> going to overtime. So so really, it, yeah, it's for them, it's all about the matchup. All right, we have a, a question in the chat room for you, if you don't mind. And I, you kind of alluded sure. to the, the, the number one, how the, the number one seeds would be ranked. But if Alabama, well, do you think Alabama could ever get to the overall number one seed? And Apache King asking, if in fact that happens, you're, would Kansas still get to the Midwest Regional in Kansas City? Well, again, um, I I don't think that order has changed since February 18th okay. with the actual committee where Alabama was number one then. So I, I think they go to Louisville, and then okay. Houston was a, Houston was ahead of Kansas that day, and Houston has not lost. So then, if if Kansas passes Houston on Sunday, um, that will just mean the committee was impressed enough with Kansas Kansas wins since that day uh, over Houston's wins, but Kansas has also lost. Um, they lost at Texas, as you guys know, right. uh, last week. Um, so I think that's just that's enough for me to not not want to move Kansas away from where they were that back in February. Um, and so I would say, uh, if everything holds the way I have it, um, Kansas is either going to go to the east or the west. Um, I think they're a hundred miles closer to New York than they are to Las Vegas by the way the crow flies. <laughs> but Kansas fans. Kansas fans might prefer Vegas, so it'd be interesting to see where they put them, um, you know, based if, if, if that is the scenario. All right, well, last thing. So Kansas, the number one seed, you no matter what, this weekend. Yes. Texas, a number two seed, pretty much no matter what, this weekend. Baylor, a two seed, but they need to watch what Marquette or Gonzaga do this weekend, correct? Or Gonzaga's already won their tournament. Yeah, Gonzaga's one. Uh, they're in the clubhouse, and uh, Marquette's playing tonight. Uh, yep. They have a big game with with UConn. Uh, and again, I don't even know if it's going to make a difference or not because the committee work is probably eighty percent done already. And, right. And I get it. I get it. That's really unfortunate because these games should mean more. Um, but if, if if things hold, I think if you're Baylor, you just root for uh, the committee to be done and and be ready to um, take that last number two seed. But uh, cer- certainly, a uh, team like Gonzaga or Marquette could pass them still, or if they if they haven't passed them already. Yeah, and Marquette, of course, beat the hell out of Baylor earlier this year. Um, right. Kansas State lost to TCU last night. Jerome Tang's been one of the great stories. We know him from his time at Baylor, but what he's done at K State. Are they a three or a four? Yeah, I think they're pretty solidly a three. Um, in fact, at the start of this week, they were the uh, the strongest of the threes. Uh, so right behind Baylor at number nine overall. Okay. Uh, yes, yesterday's loss kind of opened the door for Gonzaga to clearly clearly move above them, um, and then probably Marquette as well. Uh, but beyond that, I think Kansas State's not slide any further than that because Tennessee's still below them and. And out of all the fours, I think it's just too risky to predict that any of those have done enough to, to pass Kansas State. There's really nothing wrong with losing to TCU on a, on a neutral court. So um, I think the Wildcats can go ahead and plan on being a three seed. All right, so Texas, Kansas, Baylor, West Virginia, Iowa State, Kansas State, TCU all, all in. Oklahoma State, as you know, Rocco, lost to Texas. Uh, they're they're right there. They're wobbling. They're like Humpty Dumpty on that on that fence. Is there any chance they may fall into the tournament? They, they certainly could. You know that's that's going to be you know a committee decision they'll have to make. I, I would be surprised if they get in just from the standpoint of right now. The, the, you know, so so if you look at the Oklahoma State body of work, um, it, it, they, they missed out on all of their chances against the top of the Big Twelve. So if you if you look at the top four teams you just listed, Texas, Baylor, uh, obviously Kansas and Kansas State, they went zero and eight in those eight chances. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think that really hurts them just because um, they really they have fifteen losses. There's only been a couple fifteen loss teams in history to make the tournament. Uh, the last time it happened was Colin Sexton at Alabama. I think it was 2019. Uh, the big difference there is Alabama that year had beaten number one seeds. I think two of them. Um, and that really helped the committee get over the fact that they lost 15 games. Um, the other problem with Oklahoma State 
is they're only 18 and 15. It's very hard to get in when you're only three games over 500. You feel a little bit safer if they would have got to four over, especially if they could have won yesterday against Texas. That would have given them a great win over Texas finally Mm -hmm. and get to that guarantee of four games over. But right now they're just sitting in a position where, um, you know, they played 16 games against teams that are going to be in the tournament. And they only won four of those, which is 25% of the time they win. Um, that just doesn't feel like a team that belongs. Um, on top of that, they lost to UCF, Virginia Tech, and Southern Illinois. Those are three schools that are not going to be in the tournament either. Um, I just think that the bad outweighs the good. Um, and I, but I do think it's really close. I, I think Oklahoma State's my first or second team out. It's just, um, it's just one of those things where they, they can't select them based on that criteria. Rocco, great stuff. That's why we have you on and what the Field of 68 does, the website, the podcast that you guys have. And Rob said you were going to be great, and there's no doubt about it. A lot of people in the chat room appreciate your feedback, man. We appreciate you very much. Good luck. Will you sleep between now and Sunday afternoon? I think I finally will this year. Cause I, like I said, I don't think there's going to be a right. ton of movement. Uh, most years I, I stress out, but I've, I'm too much of a veteran now. I'm not, I'm not going to do that to myself. Um, and I appreciate you guys having me on. Happy to join you anytime. Hey, Rocco. Great stuff. Rocco Miller, the Field of 68 with us, and a lot of information 